Chapter Nine. More information. Terry Amson drove up the motorway. He and Tennyson were going to talk to the woman Marlowe had attacked before he was sent to prison. Tennyson told Amson what had happened in the case up to that time. We have three girls: Della Morne, Karen Howard, and Jeanie Sharp. All of them were tied in the same way. I still think Marlowe was the man. Pauline Gilling lived in a small house with her father. It took her a long time to open the door because it had so many locks. She was about thirty-eight, but she looked older. She spoke in a soft voice as she told them about the night Marlowe attacked her. It was the seventh of November, nineteen eighty-eight, about four thirty in the afternoon. I worked in a flower shop, but it was closed for the afternoon. I went to the hairdresser's. She was very nervous and kept coughing as she forced herself to speak. As I came up to the front door, I heard somebody call my name, Pauline. Hello, Pauline. I turned round and saw this man. I didn't recognise him. He was smiling and he walked towards me. Aren't you going to invite me in for a cup of tea, Pauline? I said I was sorry. I thought he'd mistaken me for somebody else. Then he came very close and grabbed me by the throat and started pushing me into the house. He kept hitting me, and I fell down. Then he kicked me. She stopped speaking. After a moment, Tennyson said. And then your father came in. Yes, he was upstairs. Daddy called my name, and the man ran away. My father is blind. He couldn't identify the man. But you were able to identify him. Oh yes, Pauline said. He was clever. He had a beard when he attacked me, but he shaved it off afterwards. But I recognised his eyes. I'll never forget his eyes. If my father hadn't called out, George Marlowe would have killed me. Tennyson crossed the room and sat beside Pauline Gilling. Thank you for telling me what happened. I'm sorry you had to talk about it again. I think about it all the time, Pauline said. Every time someone knocks at the door, or there's a strange sound at night, I expect him to come back and kill me. I had to leave my job. I can't sleep. He should have been in prison for years, but they let him go after eighteen months. I'm frightened that he'll come back. He said he would. As Tennyson climbed back into the car. She said to Amson, "Marlowe had a beard when he attacked her, and then shaved it off. That matches what the girls in Oldham told me. They thought that Jeanie's murderer had a beard." Two men were painting the row of garages near Marlowe's house. A few yards away, Marlowe stood, his hands in his pockets, watching them. One of the men went to his van for another tin of paint. Excuse me, are you painting all of the garages? Marlow asked. Just these, Detective Lily said. Most of the people around here park on the road, Marlow went on. My car was stolen from here not long ago. It was a beautiful car, a Rover Mark III, about twenty years old. I loved that car. It had all these silver badges on the front. He continued talking as the two policemen went on painting. Late in the afternoon, Tennyson and Amson visited Brixton Prison. They wanted to talk to Reginald McKinney, who had been a prisoner with Marlow. You were in prison with Marlow, weren't you? That's right. And you met him again after you were both released from prison, Tennyson asked. Yeah, I met him in London. We went for a meal, and then he drove me home. 
I offered to take the train, but he said he was driving near my house because he wanted to do some work on his car at his garage. Tennyson was careful not to show how excited she was. He had a garage. Yeah, that car was really important to him. He spent a lot of time on it. A prison guard looked round the door. There's a telephone call for D.C. Tennyson. Tennyson took the call. The officers had found reports on two more bodies in the north of England which had marks on them like those of Karen Howard and Della Mornay. Marlowe was still talking to Rosper and Lily when the police cars arrived. Tennyson jumped out of the first car. She ran up to Muddyman. Marlowe has a garage in another area of London. Search his flat for the keys. They must be somewhere. Marlowe watched them running towards his house. I don't believe they're doing this, he said. Moira cried as she looked at the damage. The police had rolled back the carpets and removed the floor. They had moved all the furniture and even looked inside the toilet. Tennyson and Ampson examined all the keys they had found. Why are you doing this? Moira shouted. You've searched the place before. Put everything back where it should be. Tennyson turned to Marlowe. You know what we're looking for, George. Why don't you tell us where the keys are? I park my car out on the street. I don't have a garage. Your car isn't always on the street. We've asked the neighbours. When it's not parked there, I'm away on business. George, Tennyson said, we know you have a garage. A friend of yours told us. What friend? I don't have any friends because of you. Now you've made people think I'm a murderer. We have a witness who says you told him you have a garage. Was it someone I was in prison with? Let me guess. It was Reg McKinney, wasn't it? Marlowe laughed. You must be desperate if you believe him. He's crazy. He and I had an argument. He's no friend of mine. There was a knock on the door, and Amson came in. Nothing, he said. We haven't found any keys. In a low voice, Marlowe said, I don't have a garage. If I had, maybe I would still have my car. Amson drove Tennyson home. She was pleased to have a friend working with her. She knew that she could talk to Amson, that he was on her side. If he's hidden his car, we'll find it, Amson said. What do you think of Marlowe? If he's lying, then he's very good at it. Yes, Tennyson said with a sigh. For the first time tonight, I doubted that he's a murderer. What about Shefford? As a suspect, he was one of the best police officers I've ever met. He was also in the area when Karen, Della and Jeannie were killed. We're going to have to check him out. I want you to look through all his files tomorrow, and don't tell anyone what you're doing. Jane reached for the light switch. The apartment was quiet. She put down her bag and took off her coat, shouting, Peter! Pete! There was no answer. She opened the kitchen door. The room was clean and tidy. The bedroom was the same. She opened the cupboard to put her coat away. One half of it was empty. She checked all the cupboards and drawers. All Peter's clothes were missing. In the bathroom, there was only one toothbrush and one towel. As she stood by the door, the telephone rang. She picked up the phone. Next to it was a letter. Jane, it's Mum. Your sister Pam has just had a baby, a little girl. Hello, Mum, Jane said as she tore open the envelope. The letter contained only one piece of paper. I listened to what you said this morning. I can't live with you or your work. I'm sorry to leave you like this, but I think it will be best for both of us. I still love you, but I can't see a future for our relationship. 
Maybe in a few weeks we can meet and talk. As she drove to the hospital to see Pam, she wondered if all her relationships would end like this. Peter was not the first man who had left her because she didn't have enough time. She'd never been able to stay with a man for more than a few months. She parked the car and looked at herself in the mirror. She looked terrible. Her hair needed washing, and she needed fresh makeup. It was late, and there were only a few visitors in the hospital. A nurse told her which room to go to. When she reached the door, she looked through the window, and saw Pam holding the new baby. Pam's husband Tony sat with his arm around her shoulders. Their two other children were sitting on the bed. Watching them, Jane's hand tightened on the door handle. They looked like a perfect family, a family to which she did not belong. She turned away and walked slowly back down the corridor. Later, she went back. When she went into the room, Pam wasn't there, but the baby lay in its bed. Jane moved the blanket to look more closely at the baby's face. Pam came back, and they talked until a nurse came in and said that it was time for Jane to leave. Give my love to Peter, Pam said. If I see him, I will. It's finished. Pam was upset. Oh no! Why? Is there someone else? No, there's no one else. We both agreed that it was better to finish it. Well, Pam said, you know what you're doing. Have you solved that case we saw on television? Jane paused before she answered. Her family did not understand anything about her work. They did not understand her, or how she felt about Peter leaving. No, I haven't got him yet. Good night. I'll see you again soon. As she closed the door, only the expression in Jane's eyes showed how lonely she felt. Now, all she wanted was to go home and cry. Chapter Ten. Maureen's idea. What do you think you've been doing? Kernan demanded. We had good reason to search Marlowe's apartment. I'm not talking about Marlowe. Why has Amson been looking through Shefford's files? Are you so desperate to find a murderer that you're accusing him? I talked to Amson last night. Leave it, Jane. There's no evidence that Shefford was involved. I'm sorry, but I think he did not let her finish. You've been all over the country trying to find evidence against one of the best officers I've ever worked with. I'm bringing in Chief Detective Officer Hickok to take over. As soon as he arrives, you're off the case. Amson came running down towards her as she left Kernan's office. We found another murder that links with the others. It happened in Blackburn in 1987. That means there's been one murder every year, except for the time Marlowe was in prison. Everyone is waiting for you in the meeting room. What about Shefford? Tennyson asked. Did he investigate this murder as well? No. Good, Tennyson said. At least thirty people were waiting for her. Some of them were drinking coffee and eating sandwiches. The rest were talking. The noise was very loud. Birkin and two other officers came in after Tennyson. They had been upstairs with the superintendent. What happened? Muddiman asked. We got into trouble for being too friendly with some of the prostitutes. Only a warning this time. I think Tennyson gave us some support. Maybe she's not so bad after all. Have you heard? They're saying that Hickok might be taking over the case. Quiet, please, Tennyson shouted. Now, we need to look at this case again. Perhaps we've missed something. Amson switched on a video which showed the bodies of the girls who had been murdered. Karen Howard, the first victim. Her body was found in Della Mornay's apartment, and mistaken for her. Look at the marks on her arms. The next victim was Della Mornay. She was killed about six weeks before Karen, 
and her body was hidden in a field. Look at the marks on her arms, almost the same as those on Karen's body. Jeannie Sharp, killed in Oldham in 1984. Again, note the marks and cuts. Angela Simpson, murdered in a park in 1985. He showed a picture of a pretty young girl. She was a hairdresser. She was getting married. Marlowe was interviewed during the investigation. He was staying in a hotel, fifty yards away from the park where Angela was found. There were no marks on her arms, but look at this. He showed a photograph of Angela's body. The knot in the rope which tied her hands is the same as the others. The fifth girl was Sharon Reed. She was sixteen, still at school. She worked part-time in a beauty shop. When he finished, they stopped for lunch. The men continued discussing the case as they ate their meal. Birkin was talking to Muddyman. I've been following Marlowe for weeks. He's a friendly man. He talks to us every day. Just because he was in the area when the murders happened doesn't mean that he's guilty. We know he lied about the garage, though, Amson said. Yeah, but we only have the word of Reginald McKinney about that. Someone called for Tennyson. Kernan wanted to speak to her. Looks like the boss is going to be taken off the case, Birkin said. Maureen Havers found Tennyson hiding in the ladies' toilet. Is Hickok a big red-haired man? He's in with the commander and Kernan. They're looking for you. Then they'll have to find me, Tennyson said. She went back to the meeting room to continue talking to the men. Right. We now have six victims, but no real connection between them. They didn't know each other. They didn't look like each other. They were different ages, had different jobs. The only link is that Marlowe was in the area when they were murdered. Did he kill all six? Have we missed something? Another link? Muddyman waved to get Tennyson's attention. A witness said they heard a man call out Karen's name. The same with Jeannie. The woman who was attacked, Pauline Gilling, she said the man knew her name. I see what you mean, Amson said. How did he know their names? Havers pushed to the front of the crowd. She put up her hand as if she wanted to say something, then lowered it again. She moved closer and touched Tennyson's arm. Boss. This may be crazy, but anything might help, Tennyson said. What have you got? There is a connection between the others. To Marlowe? No, to Moira Henson. When I questioned Moira, she said she didn't have a job. About fifteen years ago, she was arrested as a prostitute, and then she said she worked as a beautician. If she worked when she travelled with Marlowe, then perhaps he met the girls through her. Good for you, Tennyson said. We'll check it out. Jones came in, carrying some papers. This might be useful, boss. I've checked Marlowe's address. He's lived in this house for three years. Before that, he lived near St Pancras Station. He's had his car for twelve years. He might have a garage near his old house. The phone rang. Muddyman answered it. Boss, you want it upstairs. Shall I tell them you're here? No. Go and bring Moira in. Moira was not happy at being taken to the station. What do you want this time? she shouted. Marlowe followed her out of the house. Do you want me as well? Tennyson got out of her car. Not this time, George. They left him standing there, trying to understand what was happening. Tennyson checked that Kernan had left the station, then went to interview Moira. I am Chief Detective Officer Tennyson. Thank you for agreeing to answer our questions. I didn't agree. You made me, Moira interrupted. Tennyson opened a file. You came here on the 16th of January, is that correct? If you say so. You said that you didn't have a job. Yes. What's that got to do with anything... 
Tennyson took out another sheet of paper. In 1975, we interviewed you. You said then that you were a beautician. So? Were you also a hairdresser? Moira was getting annoyed. No, but you are a beautician. Yeah, I do people's faces, hands, nails. You could do with some help, she said nastily. I want to know where you were on these dates. Tennyson listed the dates of the murders. I don't know, Moira shouted. They were dates when George travelled to Warrington, Oldham, Burnley, Rochdale. Moira looked up. Oh, in that case I was with him. I always travel with him. So, on those dates you were with George. Were you working as well? Yes, sometimes. I work in beauty shops when I'm in those places. I want a list of all your customers, Tennyson said. Half an hour later, Moira was beginning to look tired. I've made a list of all my customers. They come to me to have their nails painted. What do you mean? Tennyson asked. Moira showed her own hands. See, my nails look real, but they're not. The false nail is painted on. Interesting, Tennyson said. Did you do Pauline Gillings' nails? I don't know. Moira replied. I have a lot of customers. I can't remember all their names. Surely you'd remember Pauline. She's the woman George was sent to prison for attacking. Tennyson pushed a photograph of Pauline across the table. Moira refused to look at the picture. No, she lied. George didn't do anything to her. What about Della Mornay? Was she your customer? Tennyson pushed another photograph across. No. Look at her, Moira. Della Mornay. I don't know her. No? You said that George came home on the night of the 13th of January at 10.30. Moira began to fight back. Look, I've had enough. Either you let me go home or I want my lawyer here. Where is George's car, Moira? We know he has a garage. Where is it? We'll find it, Moira. It's just a question of time. Tennyson stood up. OK, you can go now, but I'll want to talk to you again. It was morning when Moira got home. George made her a cup of coffee. What did she want to know? he asked. What do you think? Moira asked. She went into the bedroom and took off her blouse and skirt. Marlowe followed her. What happened at the police station? They asked me about Pauline Gilling. They kept asking me about her. I've supported you, George. But if I find out you've been lying to me... I've never lied to you, Moira. You know that. He reached out to touch her, but she pushed his hand away. Where's the car, George? It was stolen... I don't know where it is. It wasn't here, George. You came home that night without it. I remember because your hair was wet and you said it was raining. She turned and looked at him. Is it in the garage? They're going to get you because of that car. If the police find it, they can make sure that they find evidence in it. They want to get you. Boss, some new photographs of Karen have arrived. Tennyson turned away from the mirror where she had been brushing her hair. I'm on my way. Everybody is waiting for you in the meeting room. And Kernan is there. Tennyson looked worried. Okay. When she went into the meeting room, Kernan was standing in the middle of the officers. The moment she entered the room, everybody stopped talking. You wanted to see me, sir? Just for a few minutes. Kernan pointed to the door and told Amson to carry on. This was on my desk when I came in, Kernan said, handing her a sheet of paper. The officers on your team have supported you 100%. They all signed this paper to say that they don't want Hickok to take over. 
Did you know about this? Every single man on the team had signed. Tennyson's eyes filled with tears. No. No, I didn't. You're lucky. Luck had nothing to do with it, sir. We've worked hard together on this case. He smiled. Let me have any new information straight away. Tennyson went back into the room. The men were listening to Maureen Havers. These photographs were taken on the day Karen died. You can see that her nails were short. But these photographs were taken a week before. Look at her fingernails. The nails were long and red. Amson turned to Jones. Speak to her friends at the apartment. Find out where she went to have her nails painted. All the officers turned to examine the photographs. None of them looked at Tennyson. Very embarrassed, she walked to the centre of the room. I just want to say how grateful I am for what you did, for supporting me. Muddiman ran in, interrupting her. The suspect and his girlfriend are leaving their house, boss. Jones came back to Tennyson. He had spoken to Karen's friend on the telephone. Karen had her nails done at a shop in Covent Garden. Get down there, Amson said. Take Rosper with you. OK, let's go, Tennyson said. Amson, you come with me. In a moment, the room was empty except for Maureen Havers. She looked at the photographs of Karen Howard. She had a beautiful face, young and innocent. The most important thing to Maureen and everyone else on the team was to catch the murderer before another girl died. Chapter 11 The Garage As her car moved quickly through the traffic, Tennyson listened to the reports on the car radio. Detective Oakhill reported George Marlowe's and Moira Henson's movements. The suspect is leaving the taxi with Henson. They're going into Great Portland Street Station. Now they've separated. She's gone down to the trains, and he's coming out of the north side of the station. Haskins interrupted. I can see him. I'm following him. He's getting into another taxi. We'll go straight to Euston Station, Tennyson said. See if we can find him there. George Marlowe leaned in at the taxi window to speak to the driver and pointed towards Euston. But when he got into the taxi, it turned left towards Camden Town. A car moved in behind the taxi and followed it. Muddiman reported back on the radio. We're following him. He's turned back towards Euston Road. The black taxi drove down a narrow street and reached the corner of Euston Road. The traffic was heavy, and the taxi slowed down. Marlowe immediately jumped out and ran into a shop. This is Muddiman. Marlowe's left the taxi. It is now empty. Repeat, the taxi is empty. A young man on a bicycle slowed down by the side of the pavement. He spoke quietly into a radio. I've got him. He's going down Euston Road again. On the opposite side of the road, Muddiman had left the police car and was following on foot. Oak Hill nearly lost Moira Henson in the station, but he managed to get on the same train before the doors closed. He walked through the train until he was standing close to her. Moira was staring out of the window of the train. She did not know that Oak Hill was following her. Amson looked at a map. He could be heading for Euston Station or King's Cross Station. Just a minute, Tennyson said. A message came through on the radio. Marlowe's jumped on a bus. No, he's jumped off it again. He's behind King's Cross Station. There are garages behind the station, Amson said. The voice came over the radio again. Suspect has gone into a cafe. What's he doing? Tennyson asked angrily. D.C. Jones 
was checking out the beauty shops where Moira had worked. He spoke to the owner of one shop and showed her a picture of Karen Howard. Have you ever done this girl's nails? The woman looked at the picture and shook her head. I don't know. I do lots of people. Look at her again. She was found murdered on the 14th of January. January? I wasn't here in January. I was on holiday, and my friend was working here. What's the name and address of your friend? Jones asked. The cafe was very small. George Marlowe stood at the counter drinking coffee. When the only other customer in the cafe left, Marlowe spoke to the owner. Can I have the keys, Stav? Stavros pulled a box out from beneath the counter. I haven't seen you for a while, John, he said. Have you been away? Yeah, Marlowe said. How much do I owe you? Moira Henson changed trains twice and finally came out at Oxford Street. With Oak Hill following her, she walked from one shop to the next, looking through windows at the clothes and shoes. A message came through to Tennyson from Jones. I found the shop where Moira was working in January. Karen used to come here to get her nails painted. And when Moira worked here, Marlowe used to meet her after she finished. If Moira did Karen's nails, Marlowe could have seen her when he came to the shop and found out her name. Did you hear that? Tennyson asked Amson. George could have found out all the girls' names if they were customers of Moira's. So she knew what he was doing. Looks like it. Tennyson told Oak Hill to arrest Moira and take her back to the police station. Another message came through. I've got Marlowe. He's just past me. He's walking towards the garages on Battle Bridge Road. Yes! Tennyson shouted. He's going to the garages. I knew it. I knew it. She gave her orders over the radio. Everybody stay back. Don't frighten him. Stay where you are until we're ready to get him. The team closed in around Marlow. He did not see them, did not realize that the mechanic bending over an old car, the man on the bicycle carrying a ladder, the two people in the van which drove past, were all police officers. George Marlowe reached the corner of the road where it ran beneath the railway lines. He paused, looking around carefully to see if anybody was following him. Don't move, Tennyson instructed over the radio. Let him get inside the garage before you grab him. Marlowe walked slowly, turning the key around his finger. He approached a garage which looked as if nobody had used it for years. Tennyson's voice was quiet. I want him to use the keys. Everybody wait. Wait. After another long look around, Marlowe chose one key and put it in the lock of the garage door. He's going in, Muddyman whispered. He's opening the door. The door opened, and Marlowe stepped inside. Tennyson shouted, Go, go, go! Police cars screamed into the street. Rosper, Kaplan, Lily, and Muddyman ran from their hiding places and surrounded Marlowe. Rosper, the first there, grabbed him by the shoulders almost tearing the coat off him as he dragged him from the door. All the officers wanted to get Marlowe, and they handled him roughly. Tennyson's car arrived. She was about to get out when she hesitated to give the officers a chance to finish the arrest. At that moment, for no more than a few seconds, she saw another side to the character of her suspect. Marlowe seemed unconcerned at being arrested, in fact, he was unnaturally calm. He looked at Rosper and Lily, and Tennyson could see by the expression on his face that he was angry with himself. You! The painter near my house! He had not suspected they were police officers. He had trusted them. He had been foolish, made a mistake. That was why he was angry. 
Moira Henson came out of a clothes shop carrying a large bag. Oak Hill and woman police officer Southill came up behind her. Moira Henson, I would like you to come with us to the police station. Moira swung her bag to hit Southill in the face, then kicked at her, screaming that she wanted to be left alone. Her screams echoed down the street. Suddenly she stopped and put her hands over her face. Please leave me alone. I just want to be left alone. Don't touch me. I'll come with you. Just don't touch me. She allowed herself to be led to the waiting police car. The garage was very big. Water came through the roof, forming pools on the floor. The far end was dark. Near the centre of the garage was a large, covered shape. Watch where you stand, Tennyson ordered. Are there any lights? Someone switched on the lights. Tennyson approached the middle of the room. She raised the covers. Well, we've got the car. There's no radio in it. I want this car checked over for evidence. Amson was walking towards her. She stepped back, knocking into him. As she turned to tell him to be careful, she looked past him to the far end of the garage. Oh, God, she whispered. This is where he did it. On the wall were heavy chains and a collection of sharpened tools and knives. Who will you question first? Kernan asked Tennyson. Moira. She was lying when she said Marlow was with her on the night Karen was murdered. Right, Jane. And well done. Not done yet, she replied. Not yet. Moira sat smoking a cigarette. Her lawyer was beside her. Tennyson could feel the change in her. Moira was afraid. Tennyson spoke to Moira's lawyer. Mr. Shrapnel, you know that we haven't arrested Moira yet, but she's agreed to help us by answering some questions. The lawyer nodded. For the first time since entering the room, Tennyson looked straight at Moira. At 12.45 today, we entered George Marlowe's garage in King's Cross. We found a brown Rover car there. When I spoke to you last, you said you didn't know where the car was. Is that true? I didn't know anything, Moira said. I thought it was stolen. You also said that George came home at 10.30 on the night of the 13th of January. Moira nodded. When I interviewed you, you said that you didn't know any of the girls who were murdered. She put down a picture of Della Mornay. You and Della Mornay were in court together in 1971, charged with prostitution. Moira did not react. Tennyson put down another photograph. Karen Howard was a customer at the shop in Covent Garden where you worked in January. Tennyson put down two more photographs. Moira, look at these. If you don't want to look at Della, then look at Karen. George called out to her, offered to take her home in his car. He took her back to the garage and he murdered her. But first he cut her and beat her and tied her body to chains on the wall. Look at her, Moira! Slowly Moira picked up the photographs. She stared at each one, then covered the one of Karen's body with her hands. Would you get the men to leave? Just the women stay. I won't talk in front of them. Amson led Shrapnel out of the room. Moira began to speak. I didn't know Della. I didn't even remember her from 1971. But I did her nails. She came in sometimes if one was broken 
and I fixed it for her. Tennyson nodded. Moira did not really want to talk about Della. That was not why she wanted the men to leave the room. There was something else. Moira sat forward and spoke very quietly. He did it to me once, she whispered. He made this thing with rope and chains to tie me up. It hurt me. He said it made sex better. I didn't like it. I wouldn't do it again. She hung her head. I didn't know. I didn't know. God forgive me. I didn't know. Moira put her face in her hands and began to cry. Amson and Muddyman were leaning against the wall outside the room when Tennyson opened the door. George Marlowe was home by 10.30 that night, but he went out again at a quarter to eleven. She doesn't know what time he returned. Tennyson stood very straight, head up, eyes bright. We've got him she said quietly. In the garage at King's Cross, officers examined the car and took photographs. Jones and Birkin were looking inside a cupboard. Look at this, Birkin said. He held up some rubber gloves. They found clothes, shirts, trousers and coats, all clean and wrapped in plastic bags. The two men examined the floor. There's blood here, and this looks like skin. God, the smell! Birkin found a handbag. Inside there was a purse. It's Karen Howard's. Jones did not understand how it happened. One moment he was doing his job, looking at the evidence, and the next he was crying like a child. He stood there unable to stop the tears streaming down his face. Birkin put an arm around his shoulders. Go and get some coffee, okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what made me get like this. It's okay. We all go through it, Dave, Birkin said. Tennyson switched on the tape machine and began talking. This is Chief Detective Officer Jane Tennyson. Also present are Detective Terence Ampson and Mr. Arnold Upcher. We are in room 5C at Southampton Row Police Station. The date is Thursday, the 1st of February, 1990. The time is 4.45 p.m. She nodded to Marlowe. Please give your full name, address and date of birth. He sat forward and spoke into the machine. George Arthur Marlowe, 21 High Grove Estate, Maida Vale, born in Warrington, 11th September 1951. Do you understand why you are under arrest? I guess so. We have arrested you as a suspect for the murders of Karen Howard and Della Mornay. Do you understand? Tennyson asked. I'm not guilty. Marlowe turned and looked at Upcher. Please tell me what happened when you met Karen Howard on January 13th. I didn't know her name. I was told her name later, Marlowe began. She approached me. I asked her how much she wanted. We had sex, and I paid her. I didn't know her. I'd never met or seen her before. Then I took her back to the station. What about the cut on her hand? You said she cut it on the car radio. Yes, that's right. We now know there is no radio in your car. Marlowe did not react to her words. I was home at 10.30. What time did you next leave the house? I didn't. I watched television with my wife. Your wife told us that you left the house again at 15 minutes to 11. She can't remember when you came back. 
but you returned without your car. She says that your car wasn't stolen from outside the house. She's wrong. My car was stolen. I never went out again. You say that you didn't know Karen Howard? Yeah, I'd never met her before that night. Moira admits that she knew Karen. She did her nails at a shop in Covent Garden. You were there at the time and spoke to Karen. Is that true? No. Marlowe shook his head. You also said you didn't know Della Mornay. Moira says that you did. Marlowe sat back in his chair and folded his arms. I don't believe you. You must have made Moira say that. She's scared of you. I'm not. The team were waiting in the meeting room. Jones asked, How's the boss? She must be exhausted. Birkin shook his head. It's taking a long time. Marlowe looked tired. How many more times do I have to tell you? What happened this morning? Tennyson asked. Somebody called me. Didn't give his name. He said he'd seen my car on the television, and he knew where it was, at King's Cross. He told you your car was in a garage at King's Cross. You were seen unlocking the doors. He answered angrily. The man on the phone said I could get the keys from the cafe. I got the keys, but I didn't find my car, because just as I opened the door, the police jumped on me. I don't know why I have to keep telling you this. Tennyson showed no sign of impatience as she said, The man in the cafe said he rented the garage to a man called John Smith. He also cleaned your clothes for you, didn't he? Marlowe shook his head. Tennyson continued, Come on, George. How did you get Karen into Della's apartment? Where are the keys? You knew the place was empty, didn't you? You knew, because Della was already dead. I'm not saying any more, Marlowe said. He turned to Upcher. Tell her that's enough. I want to go home. That isn't possible, George, Upcher said quietly. I want to see Moira. I want to go home. Marlowe was getting very angry. We can have a fifteen-minute break, Tennyson said. You can't see Moira. Suddenly Marlowe stood up. This is a mess, isn't it? All right. I did it. Upcher jumped to his feet. Tennyson sat and stared at Marlowe. Then she said, Could you repeat that? Marlowe closed his eyes. She could see every line of his handsome face. He wet his top lip with his tongue. Then he opened his eyes. Tennyson recorded every movement in her mind. He put his head to one side. Nobody in the room moved. They all looked at Marlowe, at his strange, frightening smile. I said I did it. There was nothing else to say. Marlowe seemed completely comfortable. Eventually Tennyson spoke. Please sit down, George. She watched him carefully as she asked, What did you do? He counted his fingers as he spoke the names. Karen, Della, Angela, Sharon, Ellen, and... He screwed up his eyes, trying to remember. And Jeannie. That's right. Jeannie. George Arthur Marlowe had just admitted killing six women. Chapter 12 Celebrations 
After Marlowe was taken away, Kennison lit a cigarette. Catching Marlowe had exhausted her. Taken away from her the man she loved, stopped her sleeping, and nearly lost her her job. She sat quietly and smoked her cigarette until it was finished. Jones ran into the bar of the local pub where the other officers were waiting. He's admitted it! All six of them! He's admitted killing them all! The team rose to their feet and began cheering. An officer from another police station asked Havers, What's going on? Our boss just got a suspect to admit to six murders. Biggest case this station's ever had. Tennyson faced Kernan across his desk. Well done, he said. The trial will take a long time, but you go home now and get some sleep. You deserve it. Yeah, I need it. It was a long night. The phone rang and Kernan answered it. Yes? Just a minute. You were right, he said to Tennyson. The beautician link. It was a woman's case after all. Fifty percent of murder victims are women, so I should have plenty of work to do, Tennyson replied. Woman's case, she said to herself, still angry at Kernan's remark. She saw Maureen Havers. Maureen, are any of the officers here? Oh, I think they've gone home, Havers replied. They were all tired. It's been a long day. Jenkins wants the meeting room cleaned out. He asked if you could go down there before you leave. The meeting room was full of people. Every member of the team was there. Someone called, Here she is! And they all watched as the handle of the door turned. Tennyson walked in to cheers and whistles. A huge bunch of flowers was put in her arms, and Birkin started shouting, Three cheers for the boss! I thought you'd all gone home! Tennyson laughed. She bit her lip, but the tears still came. Then she started laughing through her tears. We did it! We got him! Many months later, George Marlowe stood in court as the charges against him were read out. George Arthur Marlowe, you are accused of murdering Karen Howard on the 13th of January, 1990. Karen's mother and father could not look at him. He had taken their daughter and murdered her. Waiting for him to be caught had been the worst part of their lives. Marlowe had not only destroyed their daughter, he had destroyed them. That on the 3rd of December, 1989, you murdered Della Mornay. Two prostitutes. Friends of Della's sat forward to look at the murderer. On the 15th of March, 1984, you murdered Jeannie Sharp. That in January 1985, you murdered Ellen Harding. Carol and Linda had travelled down from Oldham. Linda could only see the top of Marlowe's head. Jeannie had wanted so much from life but she got nothing. Nobody to help her or love her. Carol twisted her handkerchief in her hands. She could still remember Marlowe calling Jeannie's name. A young man sitting near Carol sat forward and stared at Marlowe. That in July 1986 you murdered Angela Simpson. The young man began to cry when he heard Angela's name. The years between Angela's death and the arrest of Marlowe had been very hard. For five years he had wondered if perhaps he could have saved her. For five years he had lived without the girl he loved and wanted to marry. And in October 1987 you murdered Sharon Reed. Sharon's father sat at the back of the court. Sharon's mother had died three years ago. He had lost his daughter and then his wife. 
Every day he remembered them. Tennyson kept her head down, avoiding looking at Marlowe. She looked up suddenly as the door opened and a dark figure walked in. It was Moira, and she looked twenty years older. George Arthur Marlowe, you have heard the charges. Are you guilty or not guilty? Tennyson looked at him. He was very handsome, with his dark eyes and shining hair. He looked back at her, and as their eyes met, he seemed to smile. Not guilty, he replied. 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 Not guilty, he replied.